TCP, or the Transmission Control Protocol, is a protocol that operates at the transport layer of the OSI reference model. And there are many TCP-based attacks. So as a security analyst, you'll definitely want to be familiar with how TCP is intended to function. I'll give you an example, and that example will be expanded upon later on in this course. When TCP establishes a session between two host devices, it goes through what's called a three-way handshake. The way that this works is the sender will send a TCP SYN message, and the receiver will acknowledge that by sending a SYN ACK. Now, in this case, what's going to happen is under normal circumstances, a final ACK would be sent back from the sender towards the receiver and we would have an established connection. But one common attack that capitalizes on the way that TCP is intended to function is that an attacker will send multiple SYN messages. It'll just flood with a whole bunch of SYN messages and it'll spoof the source address so that the receiving device, when it sends the SYNAC, that SYNAC goes nowhere. It goes to someone who doesn't exist, an unused address perhaps. If enough of these SYN messages are sent, the receiver will use all of its resources sending SYNAC messages, and it's never going to hear back from a sender, and so it consumes all the resources and legitimate connections cannot be established. So again, this is just one example of how we can use the protocol against itself. It's a must to understand how TCP should function. Now TCP operates at layer 4 of that OSI model that we've talked about. It's also at the transport layer of the TCP IP model. And in terms of IP protocol numbers, it is protocol number six. Now TCP provides a service to the upper layers. Now remember, there's applications. These applications want to send data, and sometimes they're going to need a reliable connection, and that's where TCP comes into play. TCP is what we call a connection-oriented protocol. Both devices have to set up a connection before the data can be sent. They're going to synchronize their session with one another, and then TCP will manage the flow. It'll adapt to congestion. It'll adjust a window size if need be. And overall, it provides reliable transmission of the data. Now, TCP establishes a pair of virtual circuits, and these virtual circuits are unidirectional. So we have one from the sender to the receiver, and one from the receiver back to the sender. So it's said that TCP operates in full duplex mode. We can send and receive on each of those virtual circuits at the same time. Now as TCP sends traffic, it also includes a checksum. And that is how TCP verifies that the information that's contained inside the header has not been corrupted. Each of these TCP segments, as they're called, are numbered, and that sequence number is used to make sure that each segment is put in the proper order, and we can use that data to determine whether or not we're missing something. So when I receive a number of TCP segments, the receiving device sends back an acknowledgement, and what that acknowledgement says is, okay, I've received everything you sent me, I'm ready for the next segment. If a segment doesn't get acknowledged by a sender, then we're going to need to retransmit a segment. Or it is possible that the session could be terminated. Perhaps the receiving device is no longer there. So TCP does some recovery services for us. It can request retransmissions if we need to. and Whenever we have a segment that is sent, if that segment is not acknowledged, then the sending device knows this is something I need to resend. So overall, that's the high level of how TCP functions. 
Now, the fields inside of a TCP header are where all of the data is contained that helps me to do the sequencing and the acknowledgements. Now, this is a TCP header, and that TCP header is going to contain some information that's relevant to the upper layers. Now that information that's going to be relevant for the upper layer is going to be the source port and the destination port. In essence, this controls how the application talks to the network or how the application puts traffic down onto the wire. So the 16-bit source port in general, as a session is established, is going to be a dynamic high number port. The 16-bit destination port is often going to be the port number that is assigned by IANA to a service. So for example, the HTTP protocol, which is used for web connectivity, uses the well-known port number 80, and it is a TCP session. So TCP port 80 is web traffic. If this TCP header were being used to communicate with a web server, that 16-bit destination port would be port 80. For HTTPS traffic, which is a variant of HTTP, it uses TLS to encrypt the data that's in transit, that 16-bit destination port number would be port 443. If we were using the file transfer protocol, then the port number would be 21. So there are a number of ports that are used Another well-known protocol is Telnet. That would use TCP port 23. And these are just naming a few of the ports that we might see here. SSH would be port 22. SMTP would be port 25. And so on. Now, that's not the only information that's contained in this header that's going to be relevant for us. We also have that 32-bit sequence number and that 32-bit acknowledgement number. And again, this is used to establish the session and to make sure that the traffic is kept in the right order. We have a 4-bit header length, a reserved field, and then we have a number of flags. Now these little flag bits get toggled back and forth during a session to indicate whether this is a SYN message, so you can see the flag right there that would be turned on if we were sending a synchronized TCP segment. We have the ACK that would be turned on, the bit would be set to 1 if we were acknowledging. So as we go through that three-way handshake, if it were a SYN ACK, well I would be synchronizing in one direction and acknowledging the session as well, so I would have both of those bits turned on. We have an urgent bit, we have a fin bit to let us know that we're finishing a connection, we have a reset bit to reset the connection, a push bit, and so on. So there's a number of bits here that are all used for session establishment and session management. We have that 16-bit TCP checksum. Again, we're going to make sure that the segment is not corrupted, that the header is not corrupted. And then we have a 16-bit window size. Now the way that this window size works is it's a sliding window. If an end device starts to receive too much data and needs you to hold off while it buffers up the data and processes it, it can adjust that window size down so you don't send as many segments at once. Once it's recovered and it's emptied out its buffers, that window size can be adjusted to a larger number, allowing you to send more segments. So these are the important fields here in a TCP header. And again, these are used to establish a session. Many of the attacks that are TCP-based attacks are going to take advantage of the standard functionality of TCP, changing sequence numbers, modifying destination ports, changing the checksum, changing the bits that are toggled for your flags.